Ladies and gentlemen, please stow all electronics, fasten your seat belts, and place your tray tables in the full upright and locked position because it's going to get weird. <sighs> I'm nervous. <laughs> all right, hey, uh, as the TCP uh, protocol goes, or in some circles, hey, hey girl, girl, <laughs> our network's flaky. But here's my data, so store it maybe. My name is Kyle Kingsbury. You might know me as Aver online, and I'm here to talk to you about network partitions. What are partitions anyway? We just don't know. Science tells us that networks which are asynchronous are allowed to drop, to delay, to duplicate, or to reorder your packets, messages, in any way they like. Now, in practice, IP networks do all four of these things, but TCP means that you won't see any duplicates or reorders in the context of a single connection. That guarantee doesn't apply if you ever lose the, con the uh, contact of the TCP session and have to reinitiate, or if you have multiple sessions going simultaneously. So you can still see some reordering or duplicate problems uh, depending on your retry and, uh, and path behavior. The really critical thing to notice is that delays and drops, you really can't tell them apart. They're the same thing. And in, in fact, we have a proof that it's impossible to build what's called a perfect eventual failure detector in asynchronous systems. You can't tell if the other node is actually dead or just ignoring you. What I want to impress upon you is that this is not just a theoretical construct. Uh, partitions are actually a real problem. Microsoft, for example, says that they see 40.8 link failures per day, ranging from five minutes to a week in the case of their you know, long distance uh, lines. And moreover, their redundancy, you know, having multiple paths for the same uh, links, only improves the odds of packet loss by 43%. So even though they've got good hardware, good you know, control change management, uh, and redundancy, they're still not able to eliminate the problem of network partitions. Google says that in a cluster's typical first year, five racks will go wonky and see 50% packet loss. They'll see eight network maintenance per year, uh, which might result in 30 minutes of packet loss on half of those. And they'll see three router failures, where they have to redirect traffic away from the data center entirely. Sherpa, Dynamo, and Chubby all cite network partitions as a driving factor, either in their initial design or in their uh, you know, sort of evolution of the system. Uh, Chubby, for example, you know, is a strongly consistent system. Uh, they actually pull some interesting tricks with, with clocks. Uh, but they still say that network outages are, are a source of major, uh, you know, sources of downtime for their system. Practically speaking, you can see network partitions due to all sorts of problems, uh, ranging from garbage collection, right? If your JVM pauses, it can't respond to messages. That's a delay. Uh, network maintenance, either planned or unplanned. Uh, seg faults and crashes, both in your routers and in your software. Uh, faulty NICs. Broadcom, for example, is notorious for uh, dropping packets under high load. They had a NIC which took flow control packets in on, a, on like a NIC backplane and spewed out the flow control for the interface to every single interface on the switch. So it essentially turned the you know, slow down, you're going too fast message into a DDoS. Um, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Uh, bridge loops, spanning tree problems. Uh, your remote hands are, of course, remote and handy. Uh, the cloud is a nebulous thing. Uh, if you've been following AWS, for example, last week there was a, a network event. Um, and then, of course, if you have WAN links, you have to worry about backhoes, squirrels, hunters, sharks, the rest of that. So these are a few of the companies that have uh, written up postmortems recently about their network partition behavior. Uh, notably, GitHub had a really spectacular one where they lost, uh, they lost synchronization between a pair of MySQL nodes backed by a DRBD-synced uh, file system and ended up with a split brain phenomenon. And one of the consequences of that, besides downtime, was that the, the data stored in one of the MySQL primaries was inconsistent with data stored in another data store. And that actually caused them to show uh, private repository information to a handful of incorrect users. Um, not the end of the world, right? Very small probabilities, uh, but the consequences can be severe. So in short, we don't live on planet Terra, no matter how much I may wish it. Uh, and our distributed systems are going to fail. And when they fail, they're not going to fail simply. They're not just going to turn off. They're going to fail in this kind of hiccupy, weird, stilted way. Uh, where maybe parts of the system work and parts don't. So I've been trying to explore these failure modes for the last uh, year or so, really. Um, and I've come up with some interesting results. This project called Jepson, uh, after that you know, famous uh, pop star from Canada, uh, is a system, like sort of a, a little network in a box. You set up five nodes, fully connected, and they run a database. And then you set up five clients outside that database cluster, and each client typically talks to one of the nodes. The clients cooperate to perform some operations, like writing a bunch of data. And then if they, uh, if they get a response that says successful, they record that. If they get a response that's like, nope, sorry, couldn't store your data correctly, they record that too. 
And then at the end of the process, you tally up all the logs from all the nodes and try to figure out what should have happened. And you compare that to what the database actually has. So by comparing the expected and the actual state, you can figure out whether or not certain properties were held, such as uh, linearizability. In this case, during the test, we initiated a network partition, separating the network into two components, a minority component, smaller than one half, and a majority component, bigger than one half. Uh, the CAP theorem tells us that there are sort of two opposing poles of maximally achievable safety properties. Um, you can either have serializability, where your system uh, orders all of its transactions in a nice, uh, you know, non-interleaving way, or you can have availability, where every non-failing node responds to all requests successfully. Now, both AP and CP systems can remain fully available in this case. And it's important to remember there's, there's a whole continuum, right? You could do any number of things in between. Certain operations could be CP or AP. Uh, you could offer linearizability over a subset of the database, but not over the whole thing. Um, but, but no matter what the case, in this particular failure mode, all systems can preserve serializability. Uh, the CP systems need to have a majority or a primary node, so it might force re-election or for quorum to shift. The AP nodes don't really care. For them, logically, it's just the same as a regular day. Um, since in an AP system, there typically isn't uh, any defined ordering for the operations. Now, in practice, AP systems do a lot of interesting things around uh, failover, setting up fallback vnodes and whatnot. Uh, but, but logically speaking, the consistency model is the same. So back at Recon, uh, I did another talk in which I explored a couple databases. Uh, I looked at single server Postgres, which is naturally a single point of failure, but it's also consistent. Uh, Redis, on the other hand, goes into split brain mode during partition and drops all the data written to one side of it. So you can't really trust Redis. And this is a, this is a consequence of asynchronous uh, replication models. Um, you can't ever fail over in an asynchronously replicated system without having the potentiality to lose some data. MongoDB, uh, every single consistency level led to lost data. Um, this is partly the cause of weak defaults, uh, because the, the old defaults were to write without even checking if your write succeeded. The new defaults are to write and then see if it worked on one node, but that's not strong enough. If you want serializability, you actually have to talk to a majority of nodes. And the majority setting actually had a bug, which caused you to consider failed network connections, i.e. timeouts and partitions, uh, as successful responses for the purposes of get last error. That's now fixed. Um, Reoc has another weak default. Uh, last write wins essentially means that you drop writes no matter what. Even if you use an external lock service, even if you use primary read, even if you use primary write all, there is no combination of consistency uh, you know, systems which can provide you with uh, a way to safely write to Reoc using last write wins. You, just, you cannot do it. The only cases where it's safe to use last write wins are where your data is immutable or otherwise uh, you know, it's, it's safe to drop something given that you've got mostly the most recent copy. In short, you want to use CRDTs, and we'll get into that later. So that was then. This is me now. Uh, we're going to be talking about some new databases, uh, MewKeeper, MeowDB, Katka, and Katsandra, uh, starting with ZooKeeper. ZooKeeper is a Paxos-like protocol. It's called Zab, uh, and it offers linearizable rights, uh, and it does that by having majorities with leaders. It looks a little bit like Paxos with presidents, but has different guarantees. The behavior is nice. Uh, it detects partitions quickly, writes will immediately fail, and majority components should continue after the election takes over. Um, as a consequence, it's only partly available, and this is exactly what we expect from a CP system. I want to demonstrate that. So I'm going to fire up a, uh, a ZooKeeper uh, client here, and it's going to talk to my five ZooKeeper nodes. Uh, and it takes a little bit for the client to initialize. What this client is going to do is they're going to write uh, a list of integers to a single Z node, which is a sort of unit of, of um, storage in, in ZooKeeper. And they're going to then read and write in a compare and set loop, trying to do atomic updates, you know, adding a single element each time. Now we've caused a partition. You'll notice that writes have stopped. This is because the cluster doesn't have consensus anymore. The old leader, which was on N1, is being forced to fail over to N3, or N4 or N5, anyone on the majority side, basically. And at that point, you'll notice that our writes, which had taken place, uh, they might have, they've got a higher latency, right? They were waiting for that uh, election to take place. But now three of the writes from the three clients talking to the majority can succeed. And then two of the writes from the minority side must stop. And that'll persist for a while. We'll see the, the latencies fall off over time um, until finally only the, uh, the minority side of the cluster is being forced to wait, forced to time out, because it can't reach consensus. Um, so this is a well-behaved system. We recover it. Uh, at the end of the day, we did 500 writes, 
and out of 401, sorry, 401 of those were acknowledged as successful, and all of those 401 writes were present in the final set. Uh, in addition, we actually found one write which supposedly failed, but was in fact present. This is a typical consequence for CPU systems which don't do, say, extended three-phase commit. So, boring. Uh, <laughs> This is exactly what you want. Your latencies are bounded. Uh, they fall off quickly for the duration of a partition. As long as the majority is intact, you can keep working. So that's great. Might, at, uh, for 50% of the time, if it's partitioned, you might see 78% uh, you know, availability, no false positives. This is perfect, right? Zookeeper is the only system I've tested so far which does CP correctly. In short, use Zookeeper. Uh, because the linearizability properties of Zookeeper are a little bit complicated, it guarantees that the sessions are linearizable, but you don't have any guarantees about what the other node sessions have seen. So they'll see all the writes in order, but one of them might be much further behind. Uh, that means that you should use existing recipes, like those in Curator, to do things like leader election and, uh, um, you know, other zookeeper-y things. <laughs> Technical terms. NeoDB. This is a fun one. NeoDB came to my attention because of this amazing post to a mailing list uh, by a man named Mr. Jim Starkey, who is a famous database engineer, um, very important man. He, he writes that the cap conjecture, he is convinced, is false and can be proven false. The cap conjecture has been a theoretical millstone around the neck of all ACID systems. Good riddance. This is the first wooden stake for the heart of the NoSQL movement. There are more coming. And it goes on in this vein for a while. Uh, the marketing claims from NeoDB, you know, I'm sort of looking into this, trying to figure out what do they actually do. This is the database he, he uh, founded, by the way. Uh, the marketing claims say that if partition resistance includes the possibility for a subset of the cores to sing on, then NeoDB refutes the cap theorem. Cool story, bro. <laughs> uh, I want that database, <laughs> right? This would make everybody's lives amazing. So. Uh, you start looking into it, it's an SQL database, it's distributed, but it's not sharded. So the whole DB lives in every node, but it is replicated for purposes of performance and for redundancy. Uh, it uses these monotonic uh, sort of leaders over ensembles of what they call atoms, um, which are sort of the granular units of concurrency in the system. Uh, and at various points in the documentation, it claims to be any or none of C, A, and P, uh, depending on what combination of the commit protocol and, uh, and other things you're using. What happens in practice with this cap theorem refuting database is you can do things like try to drop a table, but you can't drop the table because the table's identity sequence doesn't exist. So you say, okay, I'll create the identity sequence. Well, you can't create the non-existent identity sequence because the non-existent identity sequence already exists. <laughs> okay, so you nuke the database from scratch and start over. Um, this is easy to do because NeoDB does not bring its crash storage back online when you restart a node. So if you restart it, it starts up the fresh copy, no data. Um, this is desired behavior for their customers, uh, apparently. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, so there are race conditions in join. If you join nodes in the wrong order, you'll end up with uh, like split brain, but it's quiet. So like the nodes will be running you know, completely isolated copies of the database with some data that doesn't have anything to do with what their peers have. Uh, you can join a node to itself. Uh, you can, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a difficult DB to work with operationally. Like, it's, it's just hard to start this thing reliably. So I can't actually demo it for you because it takes too long to start. Um, but if you do start it, what you'll see during a failure is something like uh, duplicate value in unique index, sequences, primary key. You'll see end of stream, EUF, broken pipe, connection reset, indefinite latency. What? Indefinite? Indefinite. If you, if you let NeoDB run uh, during a partition, it will block as long as the partition lasts. Uh, right here, I'm giving up after 65 seconds, because that's when I started to run out of RAM. But uh, it will keep going, and I haven't found an upper bound. And it will actually continue to block well after the partition resolves. So in this case, this is 1,500 seconds after the end of the partition, and our latencies are still as high as 45, yeah, 45 seconds. Um, so there's a, there's a silver side to this, this cloud, which is that uh, out of all the acknowledged rights, all of them were present in the final set. So it was, it was uh, consistent. It's actually not serializable. I think it's snapshot isolated, but I haven't figured out how to test exactly the difference. Um, but it does appear to, at the strongest consistency levels, live up to its name. Uh, the, the problem, actually, is the latency. Because during the partition, absolutely nothing can take place. You kind of have to ask yourself, when was the last time you ever waited five minutes for a database query to come back? Right? Is this actually available? 
uh, what's, what's done here is you just wait until the partition is over and then replay all your operations. Everything is sort of backed up in some massive queue, and then at the end of the partition, you can finally start to apply that queue, and then you have to work out all the conflicts, and that's why it chokes for so long after the partition occurs. Um, but the new DB engineers are actually really cool people. Uh, they don't believe Mr. Starkey, uh, and, and they, they understand these trade-offs, right? So they're working hard on it. Um, they're trying to build in live detection. There's actually a beta uh, in, the, in the current build, but it's not production ready yet. Uh, and they're also addressing all these bugs, so hopefully those will go away soon. Long story short, uh, it's still a young database, uh, but if you're interested in distributed SQL systems, it is possibly worth a try. Um, you just might want to wait a little bit for it to mature. Kafka. Um, Kafka is one of my favorite systems. It's, it's uh, a messaging system, so it does these durable queues, which are these like immutable logs of messages, and then it has a system where you can consume those immutable logs uh, using Zookeeper. So you get ordering, you get durability, uh, you, get, you get sort of linear uh, shardability, um, and, it's, and it's extremely fast on any given node. Uh, so typically you can, you can saturate a wire, actually, with, with Kafka messages. Uh, so I, I love this system, and it has this new feature in 08 called replication. So you go and look at the slides, and you ask, how does this work? And it tells you that Kafka replication picks CA, consistency and availability. Well, I've, I've told you earlier that uh, out, of the, out of the cap three, you can have CP or AP, but you can't have CA. Why is that? Well, because CA systems only exist if partitions never occur. And this is very explicit in the Gilbert and Lynch paper. Uh, if a partition does occur, and I've asserted that it can, uh, then you have to suddenly worry about which one of those two you're going to pick. So anytime somebody tells you they've chosen CA, all they've done is said, I haven't considered what happens during partition. Typically, CA systems tend to fail into one of these categories or neither of them uh, when they're actually you know, subject to a failure. So the reason they can choose CA is because they're in a data center, and we know that data centers are magical, and uh, they have strong consistency, and it's bite-wise identical. Let's see how. Uh, they do this by having an in replica set. And this is actually a really, it's, an, it's a nice, simple design. It's easy to understand. Um, you, you have a, a set of replicas which are responsible for the data, and your leader writes out the, the write to all replicas, and then once all the replicas have acknowledged it, then the leader considers it committed. If a node is isolated, then the in replica set will shrink, so now we only have to replicate to two out of the three. So that allows us to tolerate node failure. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and run our Kafka cluster here. The interesting thing that they claim is that with F nodes, you can tolerate F minus 1 failures. And the way they do that is by allowing the in-sync replica set to shrink to exactly one node, the leader alone. So we're waiting right now for our Kafka cluster to wake up. Hopefully this will work. I've discovered that if I run on the laptop, there's some timing abnormalities with battery that like mess with things. Oh, look at that. That's terrible. Luckily, I've got slides. Um, so what happens uh, in the event of a, a leader disappearing is that you've got an empty in-sync replica set. Right? So there's no safe path forward. But the show has to go on. You can't just throw up your hands and declare the database is over. So instead, you promote one of the stale nodes. So you might take one of the, one of the uh, remaining nodes that are available, promote it to the leader, and whatever stale copy it's got, that's now the authoritative state of the universe. And it begins replicating it to its peers. The old leader, when it comes back online, sees the new leader, throws away its old state, and recovers the leader's rights. So this means that there's some fraction of the, of the rights. Time flows down in this picture. Uh, initially, you're able to replicate from the leader. Then you can't replicate because the partition happens, and the instant replica set shrinks to the leader alone. Rights are acknowledged only to the leader. And then when the new leader comes to power, it's not causally connected to those old rights. So when it comes back together, those rights are actually lost. In practice, you'll see a brief network uh, latency hiccup when Kafka's doing the failover, and then everything will appear to be fine. But these, these rights are actually the, the walking dead. Uh, if, you, if you suffer uh, a partition, you'll see another little network hiccup, and then suddenly half of your rights are gone. Uh, and the interesting thing is that because in a well-balanced cluster, every node in your Kafka system is going to be a leader for something, if this happens to any node, you're going to see data loss. Um, and what do I mean specifically by happens? Uh, you need two failures to occur. First, the instant replica set has to shrink, so we've got some stale node to exist. And then all the instant replica set nodes have to lose their Zookeeper connection, which forces the uh, you know, handoff to the, the new leader. Um, so if you have a leader who is partitioned away from the rest of the Kafka cluster, 
and then the leader, you know, its disk crashes or it loses power or uh, the Zookeeper cluster gets messed up or somebody, like an administrator says, oh, that's funny, I guess I'll just reboot the node. All of these things would force re-election and cause data loss. So, what do you do to improve this replication model? I mean, how, how could you do better? Um, the, the problem is that we acknowledge data that was written only to one node, and that's a little bit dangerous. So instead, what you want to do is choose a majority of nodes. And what that means is that if you ever fail, if you lose you know, coherence, uh, you've got a majority of nodes to pick from. The chances of you ending up with a single node failure that can lose data are lower. So it shifts the failure earlier in the, in the sort of timeline of the system. You're more likely to fail uh, or to stop accepting writes, but you're less likely to destroy data. And we know this is true because of math, uh, which tells us that majority quorums are provably optimal for non-dominated code reconsensus fault tolerance. So long story short, look for majorities as a general rule of thumb. Not all systems have to have them, but they're a good way to do uh, quorums and consensus among small groups of nodes. Uh, the Kafka team at LinkedIn, uh, you know, really, really smart people. They're dealing with uh, incredible constraints and incredible scale, uh, and they've got good reasons to do what they did. Um, so they're having to balance you know, the, the sort of strong correctness with performance constraints, and that means that the system is still evolving. Uh, since this is still beta, right, you should expect to see changes, and in fact, my information is probably already out of date. Uh, it's about two weeks old at this point. Um, so if present, you should turn on any stronger safety rules for Kafka consistency. Uh, you might want to roll your own replication if, uh, if this doesn't provide satisfactory properties. Um, and finally, you know what, I, I trust the engineers, right? Like, they're, they're smart, this is still early, they're gonna get it right. Moving on to Cassandra. Uh, everybody asked for this one after the last talk, and it's, it's gonna be a big one. So Cassandra is a dynamo system, first off. Uh, that means it has a hash ring. So you have keys, and the keys get hashed into some space, and you carve up the space into chunks, and you hand the chunks to different nodes. You use uh, hinted handoff, quorums, active anti-entropy to repair. Looks just like React or, uh, or Voldemort or Dynamo. Uh, but unlike the Dynamo paper, it doesn't use vector clocks. It uses last right wins only. And if you saw the previous talk, you're probably throwing up your hands at this point. Uh, but in fact, Sally, it depends. You can't safely change a last right wins register. And by safe, I mean you want to guarantee that your write is causally connected to a future state, that your write isn't just thrown away entirely. Uh, because in a last right wins system, if you are adding A, B, and C to a set, maybe first you start with A, two nodes concurrently read A and B, and then one of them writes A, B, the other one writes A, C, last right wins is going to pick one of those writes to succeed, and the other one will just disappear. It's like it never even happened. So if there's a case where you don't want to lose your writes, you can't use last right wins. Now, vector clocks allow you to identify that causal isolation and give you both copies back. So you'd see A, B, and A, C, and then it would be your responsibility to merge them into a single value, like A, B, C. That merge function has to obey some properties, uh, properties which are a little bit non-intuitive, honestly. It has to be associative, commutative, and idempotent. And if you do those three things, you get this structure, uh, a semi-lattice, called a convergent replicated data type. Uh, and this is a, a nice type of consensus that you can get for AP systems. Um, but I can't actually get into the theory here because we're out of time. The long story is that Cassandra chose early in its evolution not to use vector clocks, and did that for performance reasons. It didn't want to have to do a read before every write, so they can go twice as fast in terms of network round trips. Uh, but as a side effect of that, there's no safe way to modify a cell in Cassandra. Some people say you can with an external lock service, and just like with React, they're wrong. Um, if you write uh, using like quorum uh, R plus W, and, uh, and, and you know, an external lock service, so your writes never uh, interleave. You might see like 44% of your writes acknowledged, but only, but out of those, roughly you know, a third of them would just be thrown away. Um, so this is particularly interesting in light of the Cassandra documentation, which like on the front page says that it can be tuned to give you strong consistency in the cap sense. Uh, I don't know where that idea comes from. So you can't do changes, but, but you could do something different. Uh, in Cassandra, you actually can write really efficiently very large numbers of, of uh, cells to a given row. So what you do when you're making changes to data structure is you write everything as a new change. You build an immutable log of operations such that every operation is its own cell. And then when you read, you get back all of those cells. So we add cell A, cell B, cell C. And then when you do a read, you have to merge those cells together somehow. So you apply a merge function. This should look familiar. And then uh, you have to do some garbage collection eventually. You might have to like, clean up old elements of your set. 
Uh, Vector clocks, you know, handle that for you, but we're, we're getting a performance advantage here, right, by not having to do round trips. But the, the critical thing is that when you're doing reads in Cassandra, that merge function has no, no well-defined order, right? You don't know when new values are going to show up in the past, and you don't know what the interleaving is going to be. It might not be stable. So because of that, your merge function still has to be commutative. You still have to do all the same reasoning about out-of-order operations that you do with Reoc. The difference is that your merge function is expressed over rows instead of over a single object. What this means is that React and Cassandra have essentially equivalent consistency semantics. React is slightly stronger, but it's, uh, you know, the performance characteristics are so wildly different that it's not really worth comparing them. Um, React, for example, can't handle anywhere near a you know, tenth or a hundredth of the write load that Cassandra can. So if you're doing uh, like log structure data, analytics, um, you know, large OLAP cubing, Cassandra might make a lot of sense. If you're working with data structures where you want to like, deeply nest a single CRDT and have guarantees of the atomicity of writes for that CRDT, then it makes sense to use React. Let's go ahead and try it. Oh, we're not going to try that one. Cool. So uh, what happens if you actually write to a, uh, a Cassandra uh, data structure? They have this thing called CQL, which is a new query language. And one of the things in CQL is uh, collections. And the collections are basically these, these uh, limited CRDTs. So you can do your writes to, say, a CQL set or a CQL list. And every one of them, even in the presence of a partition, will succeed. Latencies would be phenomenally low. Again, this is because you're, you're writing everything uh, to distinct cells. At the end of that, you might see that all 100% of them were acknowledged writes, and that every one of those acknowledged writes succeeded. This is a great phenomenon, right? It's not ordered. It's not, it's not consistent in a cap sense, but it is safe. It's a different kind of consistency property. So the CQL collections are partition tolerant and highly available, but the semantics are a little bit subtle. Uh, in particular, you might have to worry about deletions. For example, if you delete from a set, uh, the way it does that is by writing a, a tombstone. And a tombstone actually has some, some time information encoded in it. So you can actually delete writes from the future, uh, which, which is what you might expect if you used uh, like any, any sort of eventually consistent system. Like the, the deletes typically are really complicated. You either have to include a vector clock in the delete record or, or a timestamp, and, and the timestamp version you know, means you can delete future writes. Uh, there's a, new, a different kind of set you can use called an observe remove set, which actually doesn't have this problem. You can only delete things that you've seen. Uh, but Cassandra doesn't use that. Uh, another data structure Cassandra doesn't use is PN counters, which allows you to do safe counters in a partition tolerant way. Uh, instead, because of Twitter and or politics, we have something else, uh, which will under overcount by basically 100% during partition. So if your partition lasts for 50% of the time, you might see like either 50 out of 100 writes or 150 out of 100 writes, depending on what you want. Um, again, not the end of the world. They're very fast, right? It could be totally appropriate for use case. Isolation. From a transactional asset standpoint, the data stack stocks say, atomic row operations give Cassandra transactional atomic, isolated, and durable support. We know what atomic means. Atomic means that if I write x and y together, I'm going to see nothing or x and y. I'll never read just x. But what does isolated mean? Like, show of hands, how many people in the audience know what isolation means? Like, 10? Cool. Uh, you're, I'm not one of those people, uh, but it turns out that mathematicians do know what it means. Um, we've, we've got a bunch of different behaviors, and these are a little bit arbitrary and complicated. Uh, there's things like P4, which is lost update, uh, phenomenon 3, which is phantom writes, uh, fuzzy reads, dirty reads. These don't really apply to Cassandra because there's no notion of a transactional read than commit. Um, but, but there is a different sort of uh, even more basic consistency for isolation called P0. Uh, that's a phenomenon called dirty write where your writes are interleaved. And, and intuitively, it seems like interleaved writes would be bad. Imagine that you wrote 1, 1 and 2, 2 to a single record. Uh, so 1 goes to the first cell, 2 goes to the first cell, 2 goes to the second cell, 1 goes to the second cell. Because your writes are interleaved, out of 1, 1 and 2, 2, you might get 2, 1. So this is, this is an inconsistent, like a, a dirty uh, sort of read. You don't want to see just part of your transaction at the end of the day. What you want is for them to appear to apply you know, as, as isolated chunks. This is so important that Berenson and his friends at Microsoft in their paper say that ANSI SQL isolation should require P0 for all isolation levels. Not supporting P0 means you can't claim to be uh, serializable, can't claim to be snapshot isolated, can't claim to be cursor stable, can't claim to be any of the ANSI SQL isolation levels. You can't claim to be isolated. 
But it does claim to be isolated. Uh, Cassandra 1.1 row-level updates are now made in isolation. It guarantees that if you update both login and password in the same update, then no concurrent read may see only a partial update. Or another part of the documentation, uh, transactional, atomic, isolated, and durable support in the ACID sense. Uh, Hacker News comments, everybody thinks that if you write X and Y together, you'll see X and Y together. You won't. Uh, Cassandra actually allows P0 and more uh, isolation abnormalities. And the reason is that in Cassandra, the right order doesn't actually matter. Last right wins is the only thing that matters for conflict resolution. And last right wins takes place on a per cell basis. So if you're looking at two cells and they have equal timestamps, you've got to pick one somehow. And that, that choice should be stable. So you choose the one that has the bigger value, lexicographically, perhaps. So if I write 1, negative 1 in one transaction, and 2, negative 2 in a different write, the first cell is going to say that 2 is bigger than 1 and pick 2. The second cell is going to say negative 1 is bigger than negative 2 and pick negative 1. So now I've derived a case where the two don't line up. I should have seen 1, negative 1, or 2, negative 2, but instead I've got 2, negative 1. In short, this is P0. Does this actually happen? Well, that's a little bit complicated. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and run an isolation test. In this test, our Cassandra cluster is going to take a bunch of writes, which look like 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2, that sort of thing. And it's going to verify that at the end of the day, out of all the, it's not going to verify. Take a look at the logs. So we'll wait for that to come up. Uh, so it sh well, the writes are going to the writes are going to be writing one negative one, two negative two, three negative three, et cetera, and they're all going to just be contending on on a similar set of rows. And in this system, we're actually going to write uh, every row twice. So there's going to be one opportunity for a conflict per row, and that row is going to be written to with a, a mean uh, latency between the writes of 100 milliseconds, uniformly distributed from zero to 200. Let's see if it's woken up yet. Man, live demos. <laughs> wow. OK, cool. I'll show you the results instead. Uh, the answer is that it depends. If you do some math to figure out how likely timestamp conflicts are, you can find out that the probability of seeing a conflict in any given read, assuming you're doing your writes uh, Poisson distributed to a single cell, uh, varies with the uh, frequency of the writes. So if you do one write per second, probability of reading a conflict in any given read is 10 to the minus 7th. If you do 10 to the 6th writes per second, it's basically one in two reads will be corrupt. Uh, if you do 10 writes per second to a cell, and you read it once per second, in any given day, you've got about a one in three chance of seeing corrupt data. This is not, this is not a bad result, by the way. Right? I mean, if you're updating that record all the time, uh, chances are the data doesn't actually matter that much. Right? Like any given value of it will be immediately succeeded by some valid value. So it could be you just show some inconsistent data briefly. But if it's mission critical that isolation actually hold, this doesn't work. If you do two writes per row, and they're separated by mean latency of 100 milliseconds as Poisson processes, the probability of seeing a corrupt row is basically 10 to the minus sixth. But this is actually a theoretical limit, right? We've just done the math about how often you know, uh, microsecond timestamps can collide. If you actually do this in practice, at least with the Java driver, you'll find that one in 250 rows is corrupt. So 1 in 250 is a lot bigger than 10 to the minus 6th. What happened? <laughs> uh, the reason for this is that somewhere in the guts of either Cassandra or the drivers, I haven't figured out where exactly, something is trying to figure out the millisecond timestamp to use for the write. And it does that by taking, sorry, microsecond timestamp. It does that by taking the millisecond counter or the millisecond clock in Java and tacking on three zeros to the end and calling it good. So the chances of seeing corrupt data may, much, may be actually much higher than you expected. Uh, long story short, um, there is no uh, case in which you can actually provide real isolation with Cassandra. Like, you only want isolation if you're doing your writes at the same time. If you're doing it at the same time, they're going to eventually hit the same timestamp. So your guarantees are probabilistic at best. Just keep that in mind. If you do want uh, transactions, However, if you want to do your operations in an isolated way, Cassandra has introduced this really cool feature called lightweight transactions. Transactions offer linearizable consistency, uh, according to docs. And uh, they do this by doing Paxos rounds. So 
you, uh, you set up a Paxos quorum over the owners of that, that given part of the hash ring, and you do your, uh, your reads and writes inside of these, these uh, you know, compare and set loops, essentially. So your compare and set gives you this nice, um, correctly uh, ordered series of operations. First thing you'll notice if you try this is the Java driver doesn't support them. Uh, the only support is actually in the Python driver, uh, and only then via the Thrift interface, so it's a little bit awkward. So you get in, in touch with Datastacks, and they help you out. They you know, um, add the right constants to the driver, and you, and you give that a shot. Uh, maybe my Cassandra nodes will actually cooperate today. Let's try some transactions. Work. The first thing you'll notice when you run Cassandra transactions in 2.0 is deadlocks. Uh, and by deadlocks, I mean permanent deadlocks. I mean, if you push more than like 10 transactions through Jepson on a Cassandra cluster, it'll lock up the cluster permanently. You can't do any more transactions on it uh, until you go and you clear the system access table, which you know is unsafe. Man, I don't know why this is not working. All right, well, someday. Uh, if you go and you get a copy of Cassandra from Git that has this bug fixed, and then you can actually run the transactions, but they're not linearizable. Um, in fact, there's two bugs in the current Paxos transaction library that I found last week, and those are 6012 and 6013. Uh, basically, you can accept two distinct values for any given Paxos round, and a fail proposal can still succeed in a later round. That means that out of a given series of Cassandra transactions, you might see 5% of them succeed, the reason that so few of them succeed, that the Paxos transactions are so unavailable, is because they're really slow. It takes four network round trips to do an operation. Um, now, you can make this faster by using uh, fast Paxos or Paxos with presidents, et cetera. Uh, but as it stands, you, know, you really can't push more than, I don't know, 50 or so transactions per second through my cluster without it basically falling over. Uh, you'll also notice that out of those transactions, 4% of them might be lost. So that's a catastrophic result, right? Like, you're, you're never supposed to have Paxos lose your data. Um, and then you see, you see some false negatives, too. So this is, this is uh, interesting, right? Like, this is a production release. Uh, the advertising all over the place claims it offers these linearizable properties. But it seems like nobody actually checked to see if they worked. Um, but at the same time, you, you know, like, a couple days after I found this and reported to Datastacks, this thing comes out, and it says, uh, Apache Cassandra's development of lightweight transactions in CQL are true industry firsts. I, I don't know what this means, actually, because like Chubby, uh, Libpaxos, uh, Wandisco, you know, plus Zookeeper and all the other consistency systems, I, I, I'm just, I have a really hard time reconciling the advertising with the reality. So what does this all mean, right? I, I know I've, I've ragged a lot on, on Cassandra and these various uh, you know, inconsistencies, but the fact of the matter is that it's a very good database, and it's a very mature database for the subset of functionality that's not new. Um, you can use it as, a, as an AP store. So anywhere where your writes can be commutative, you can use CRDTs. Uh, you can either write your own CRDTs on top of the, the rows, or you can use the CQL collections, which are really well formulated. Um, the new data structure uh, layouts in, in CQL are much more intuitive, much easier to understand than the old system. Uh, keep in mind that isolation and atomicity guarantees on writes are probabilistic at best. If you rely on them, you need to run the probabilities and verify that they hold. Uh, and you should probably avoid transactions for the foreseeable future. Um, those two bugs, 6012 and 6013, plus the deadlock bug, uh, were all found with like you know an hour's testing with uh, with Jepson. Um, those are now fixed, but I'm not convinced that the testing culture at Datastax has gotten to the point where I would necessarily rely on the advertising time and what works. So, uh, use Cassandra, use it for AP stuff, logging, storage, it's terrific at that. To recap, Jepson tells you about one system. Um, and, and by system, I actually include the clients, right? Because the clients and the application semantics and the network and the failure topology and, and the servers and the versions, all this stuff interacts, right? Even, even individual Jepson runs of the same software uh, can vary greatly because you might hit its particular timing abnormality which causes a failure. So that means that I can't tell you about your systems. You shouldn't take these results to mean that, oh, you know, Kafka's bad or Cassandra's bad. It's, it's instead, here's a particular interesting way that a system uh, could fall apart. And you can use these same techniques to measure your own systems. Ultimately, you'll have to generalize these particular stories into, into you know, uh, what matters for you. 
you should go back to your architecture diagrams and, and ask questions like, what happens if a node disappears? What happens if our nodes uh, pause or hiccup for three minutes and we can't get anything to them? Um, GitHub, for example, had a network uh, event which caused packets to get delayed for five minutes. So they had a stoneth cluster, right, shoot the other node in the head. Uh, each one declared the other one unavailable and issued a shoot the other node in the head message and fired their bullets, basically. Uh, but the bullets were suspended in midair because of the network partition. And they were held in the buffers of the switches for five minutes. Then the network partition you know, sorts itself out. I think it was something to do with mlag. And, uh, and the you know, bullets slam into both servers simultaneously, and they collapse to the ground in a pool of data. Um, <laughs> I, I may be getting the details of this wrong, but you should read the postmortem because it's just it's amazing. Uh, worry about that. Uh, you need to ask careful questions about clocks, right? If you rely on clocks and you're considering them unique, do you have sufficient resolution for the right volume you're planning to do? Uh, if clocks are far in the future, you know, decades or, or, or minutes, uh, is that a problem? If you have a leap second, like we all saw with that, um, you know, uh, leapocalypse last year, uh, <laughs> you know, you can see the, the same second repeated twice, and if you're subtracting seconds, you might see zeros. Just uh, be concerned about those sorts of things, right? Wherever possible, try to rely on logical clocks on the consistency of your data and your operation flow instead of the, uh, the wall time. Ask questions like, what happens if a network delivers a message late? Or what if there's no majority? What if, what if you do have a majority, but it's on the opposite side, or it keeps shifting? What happens if you can see two different nodes, but they can't see each other? This happens in EC2 all the time. Uh, and what I'm really driving at here, you need to define the, the liveness guarantees and the safety guarantees that your system actually needs, because ultimately, Losing data can be OK. Inconsistency can be OK, right? Cassandra can be a phenomenal place to store uh, log-oriented data, especially data which is slightly noisy, because the inconsistencies are never going to matter. So ultimately, you have to balance the complexity and the difficulty of writing a correct system and the performance costs with the correctness. Finally, what I want to emphasize, right, no matter what trade-off you choose, no matter what system you're writing, write a test program. Have it make some reads, make some writes, log what happens, and then measure that your model of the system aligns with what the system actually does. Cause failures while you're running that test program. Kill nodes. Use IP tables to cut off nodes from each other. Skew clocks, right? NTP is not reliable. Finally, see what comes out. I think you might be surprised. I'm indebted to the individuals at Datastax, at NeoDB, and at LinkedIn for their assistance in understanding and debugging these systems. In uh, commutative order, Jonathan Ellis, Rick Branson, Eric Lindvall, left side, Patrick McFadden, Alexei Yashenko, Seth Proctor, Duke Adamonis, Neher Nakede, June Rao, Kelly Summers, Drew Blas, Michael Klishnan, Camille Fournier, Jay Kreps, Joseph Blomstedt, Peter Bayliss, thank you very much. <laughs>